And so right now, I just want to invite uh, uh, David, uh, Coach Nelson. He is the husband of Tamara. He has four daughters, a son-in-law, and a grandson that is three months. Three months and old. And he is excited to share with us, though he wasn't too excited about the flurries last no. night coming from Texas. Nope. So let's give mm -hmm. him a big round of applause. Thank you. So good, it's morning still, right? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I bring greetings to you from your brothers and sisters, the saints that gather at Real Life Ministries Texas and Tomball. So uh, super happy to be here with you this morning. Um, as he said, my name is David Nelson. Uh, I'm still referred to by several or most as coach uh, because that was my title for about 30 years and and you'll have a chance to hear about some of that here in a little bit. But basically what I want you to know is I am here to proclaim the kingdom of God and teach about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And if you recognize where that came from, that is from Acts 28, right? And so uh, from what I understand, most of the churches are, that are represented here are restoration churches, right? R raise your hand if that's you. Okay, I, this is, I know in lectureship, I'm not supposed to like, but this is going to be participatory. Y'all okay with that? Uh, so here's the reason why I ask. Uh, y'all are my people and, and y'all are going to learn about me. And I remember growing up, uh, we oftentimes talked about, you know, being the church of Acts. And the amazing thing about Acts is it ends with Paul uh, in Rome, which is the highway to to all the information in the world and it said that he was there to teach about the kingdom and proclaim Jesus Christ right and it said he was going to do that without bold with boldness and without hindrance and then acts doesn't really conclude that's just that's how that's how it ends but it doesn't conclude because the harvest is still happening right so if we are if we are to be the book of Acts, if the church in the book of Acts, we should pick up where Paul left off. Uh, we're just a few years down the road, right? So uh, what I've noticed is no one really talks much about the kingdom anymore, you know? Um, uh, most of what's talked about is, is when we talk about God's power, it's usually spoken of in the past tense. Um, you know, we'll, we'll come to church and we'll talk about what God did with Moses. It, it was about what God did then with them. And then we kind of apply it to ourselves and go, well, maybe we should be like that. Um, but what, I, what I'm here to say is that that's not true. Um, God, Jesus is alive and well. The kingdom is in, within all of us. Um, Jesus doesn't walk the earth anymore, but his hands and feet are still present. That is all of us. And, it's, and it, by the way, it's still on the move. So uh, when Christ was here, the kingdom was always present because he is obviously the king of kings. Um, but when the kingdom, it will be future in completion when he returns. But now the called out ones, which is us, the church. Uh, by the way, I wrote all this out. So um, I, I, the reason why I'm struggling with it is I can't read my own writing. But, so I'm just going to kind of do it. But here's what I want to say. The church is the called out ones. It is who we are. We are the ones that have been called out of the citizenship of the world and into the citizenship of the kingdom. Uh, we should have a kingdom mindset. And our job, compelled by love, is to take the gospel uh, of, his, of this kingdom to the ends of the earth. We are the custodians of the kingdom. It's something that we should talk about. And when one lives the kingdom path, the amazing works of God can still be seen. And I'm going to prove it to you. Okay. Um, so how many of you are familiar with Acts chapter 8, with Philip and the eunuch story? Right? I mean, that's, that's like a theme deal. Like, this is why we should get baptized. Because when the eunuch, when he came to his senses, like, here's water, let's do this. Right? And, and what's always kind of interesting to me about that story is Philip was just kind of minding his own business, and he, he gets visited and is like, hey, you got to go visit with that guy, right? And the next thing you know, he's there. Uh, so I just kind of want to draw a picture of how I ended up here. 
Okay, are you all willing to go on this journey with me? It's kind of crazy. So I want to tell you a story about a man named Jim Putman. Uh, Jim Putman um, was at one time an atheist, but uh, through the course of his life, Christianity was proven true to him a lot by the influence of his father. Uh, it was kind of one of those deals where he said, all right, if, um, if, you, can, if you can prove that Christianity is false, uh, I'll stop being a pastor. That's what his dad said. And he said, okay, uh, well, if I can't, then I'll be a Christian. So Jim Putman becomes a Christian. He ends up planting a church in Post Falls, Idaho. Now, if you know anything about Post Falls, Idaho, that's not the most receptive. The Pacific Northwest is not the most receptive place in the world to plant a church, right, to the gospel. Well, so he uh, is looking for a place to plant a church. He goes into a movie theater, and in the movie theater, he, he meets the owner, and they, they agree that they can have church there, and so they start a church there, and then the movie theater owner's son starts attending said church. And so eventually, uh, he gets locked in, and uh, Jim starts discipling him, and over the course of time, it, uh, he asked this young man to be the small groups minister there at the church, right? And he's like, uh, okay, except I don't really know how to do that. He's like, no problem, you'll figure it out. So what this small groups minister did was, is he went to the Bible, which is a really great place to start, don't you think? And, and he kind of looked at how Paul did it, how Jesus did it, how all of those kinds of things, and he kind of put together a, a program. Okay, so what we need to do is make the church smaller and have the discipleship within the church and the people lead it and those kinds of things. And guess what happened to that church in the godless Pacific Northwest? It exploded to thousands of members. And any time you have growth that's that exponential, what eventually happens is, is people want to know how you did it. And so uh, over the course of time, people came out there and wanted to know, how did you make this church out there grow like you did? And this young man that I'm talking about and, and those that were involved just looked at the Bible and went, we, we did it like that. We use Jesus' method and his message, and, and we're going to talk about that while we're here. Well, that young man's name, he's, he's an older guy now. He's still younger than me. His name is Brandon Gendon. Brandon Gendon is, is the lead uh, pastor at our church um, there in Texas. And so that's part of the story. So another part of the story is um, about five years ago, there was a, a horrible flood there in Houston, Texas. And, and um, I was a victim of it. I had two feet of water in my house. Uh, but also another victim of it was a man by the name of Greg Ranger. He's sitting back there. Raise your hand, Greg. He didn't know he was going to be involved. Uh, so, uh, so Greg uh, had his house flooded, and Real Life Ministries put together a team. They came to his house. They met Greg. Uh, guess what they did? They invited Greg into a group, uh, started doing life with Greg. Greg is now, five years later, he's, a, he's the missions pastor of our church, planting churches in Italy, Ethiopia, where else? All, like, uh, what, another one relatively close to us? Right. So you've been busy, right? And, and so do you see how this is all kind of working? So now this is kind of doing this, right? And then, okay, and so that, that's Greg. And then there's a gentleman next to him, that's Ron Hilly. Um, Ron Hilly is, is a, we don't say former Marine, he, he's a United States Marine, was in Vietnam, uh, served at the United States and that. This man actually jumped on a grenade, okay, jumped on a grenade to save his platoon, it turned out to be a dud, but you still get credited as righteousness for jumping on a grenade for your people, because um, it could have killed you. And so uh, I say that, that God spared him so that he and I would meet. Are y'all still on the journey with it? Because I haven't told you my journey yet. Okay? So, uh, so here's my journey. Here, here's how we're all in this same room together. Like, I'm telling you, God does amazing things still. He still works out stuff like he does in the Bible. So my journey is this. Uh, I was born, and I was at Hanley Church of Christ the very first Sunday that I possibly could be. I think I was born on a Tuesday. I was there that next Sunday. Okay, that, that was the kind of folks I had. And kids don't do that anymore. My, my daughter just had a, a, a grandson, and, you know, it took her about a month before she brought him outside. But my parents were like, here we go, 
right? I was in church that first Sunday. And uh, Hanley Church of Christ, old acapella church, okay? Any of those in the room? I just want any represented acapella of Church of Christ. We were that church, okay? Very, very conservative. But I'm so unbelievably, incredibly uh, grateful for my heritage because I'm going to tell you what, growing up in Sunday school, I had a teacher named Mrs. Hobbs. Um, I, I'm sure she's gone now, but Mrs. Hobbs, she was old then. But Mrs. Hobbs, like she had the biggest calves that I've ever seen. And she was just a big old woman and she had the most beautiful singing voice that I ever heard. But I'm going to tell you, I got a master's degree in the Old and New Testament because of Mrs. Hobbs. When I say I got, I mean, I'm going to tell you, like I was, before I was 10 years old, I knew all of the covenants. I knew, I knew it all. Like I saw how it all lined up. Uh, Christianity was a very logical thing for me. I knew a lot. In fact, I probably knew too much. And the reason why I knew, you can't know too much, so don't, don't take that the wrong way. But like I, I knew so much that I was kind of, uh, I knew enough that when, we moved and we switched churches and I would go to church camp and all those things. Y'all remember the days of, of church camp? I hope you do. Where, you know, you, you'd go all week and then Friday night you'd have the big appeal, the big emotional appeal, and then people would go get baptized and all your friends would go get baptized and all that kind of stuff. Um, I never did. I never did because um, the way I logically understood covenants and what was going to be expected of me, I, I, I didn't think I could hold up my end of the deal. Now, the beautiful thing about covenants is, you know, what makes a covenant a covenant is I hold up my end of the deal even when the other side doesn't, right? That's, that's how God is with us, and thank God for that. But I can remember being logical about this, like I'm not going to just force myself into this uh, without, without thinking this through. Like I want to make sure I can hold up my end of the deal before I do this. And so... Uh, so I, you know, I, I went on to be about 17 years old and I still hadn't really surrendered my life to the Lord, even though I knew so much about, it. I could, I mean, I loved him and, and I was, it was logical and I could put it all together and it made sense and I wanted it, but I was worried about me. I wasn't so much worried about him. Does, does that make sense? And so it wasn't until, um, I was on weed harvest. So by the way, I've had the greatest life ever. I've had like a Forrest Gump life. Uh, I played football. I was a custom weed harvester, so I'm, I, I farmed a little, I, I, so to speak. Uh, I harvested, at least. Um, Marine Corps, um, coach, state champion. I mean, all these kind of really cool things. Turns out now I'm a Bible professor. Who knew, right? Um, so I've had a really, really great life. But I was on weed harvest, and... and um, I wrecked my combine. I, I, I didn't have my header up high enough when we were going over a bridge. My uncle went over first. He went over uh, with his header all the way up. I thought mine was all the way up. I caught the bow on the end, ripped the header off, spun the combine around, and, and the combine went on top of the header. And I'm looking at uh, a creek below. And uh, my impending doom was like right there. I was look there it was. All, the, all that had to happen was that combine to fall off. And I can remember thinking, like, okay, I'm serious now. Father, if you will allow me to somehow reverse out of this, I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of messing around. I'm yours. I pulled the hydrostat back. Somehow that combine went against gravity. The back end of it slammed down, and I was safe. And my grandfather comes over the hill. And the very first thing he says is, he said, you get in that combine and you go cut that field. And my grandfather wasn't a very kind man. Uh, he wasn't. And uh, later that night, he said this. He said, I'm so glad that you're okay. Because if you would have died lost, I never would have gotten over it. And that was the first time I'd ever actually heard somebody say the word lost. Uh, because most of what I heard growing up in my church experience was wrong. Like you would have died wrong. <laughs> and then, I, I, so from this man that wasn't always very kind to me, I heard something very loving. And when, then I started thinking about Jesus with that. You know, he, he, 
he treated people as if they were lost, not necessarily wrong. The, most of the people he treated wrong were the ones that were supposed to know better, right? So, um, so from there, uh, so I gave my life to Jesus, and then, uh, so I was baptized at 17, and then I walked uh, out of that. My, my dreams for football didn't work out, so I joined the Marine Corps, and so now I'm in the real world on my own, and you know what? It's a very hard place to be a Christian. It, I'm not saying the Marine Corps, but the world is a hard place to be a Christian on your own. And yet there I was. And so um, I probably wasn't living up my end of the covenant just as like I didn't think I would, right? And then I met my lovely bride, and, and it all came back to me relatively quick. It was kind of interesting. When we started dating, I didn't know what her re religious affiliation was. And um, she told me on the phone, she asked me to come to church with her. I'm like, yeah. You know, I, and she goes, oh, I'd really like for you to come. I said, where'd you go? She goes, Hidden Valley Church of Christ. I'm like, yes, right? Like, because I'm going to tell you just in that one sentence, I knew so much about her already. Uh, I knew so much about her, her background and, and what she believed. And I was like, okay, well, this is, this is, this can go somewhere. And so I ended up being a football coach. And I want to tell you why I did that. Because I remembered a young man that left and went to the Marine Corps and tried to be a Christian on his own. And it was a pain point for me. It was a lot of pain for me. Um, and, and the pain goes back even further. It, a message I took from my parents that they never, my parents were saints. Y'all have to hear that. My parents were saints. Uh, they took in some foster kids and, and the, the evil one will use people that you love the most to give you messaging, right? Would you, would you agree with that? And the message that I got was, you're on your own. And then when I went to the Marine Corps, I was like, oh, well, here we go. I'm on my own. And I believed it. My parents never said that. I want you all to know that. My parents are awesome. So I joined the Marine Corps, uh, became a football coach. But I didn't want any young men to ever feel like they had to walk this thing out alone. So I've, I be created like a ministry with my football team where young men could be discipled. And I would hire coaches that could disciple them. Isn't that crazy? Uh, and because that was the only place that I thought that could do it, I could do it, right? Uh, that, that kind of thing wasn't really going on in church. And in fact, I, I tried to bring it to church and they were like, you know, I, I actually had a church tell me one time, David, you're a prophet and the church doesn't need prophets. The church needs priests. And I still don't know what that means. I, it doesn't, I still don't know what that means. Can anybody explain that to me? If you see me, tell me, let me know. Well, basically, we don't need you telling us what we should be doing. We just need people that are just holding things together. That hurt my feelings pretty bad. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm on my own there too. And so uh, I created this discipleship movement within football, and that's where I got notoriety. It's kind of weird. Uh, I didn't ask for it. Like all of a sudden, I ended up on podcast. All of a sudden, I, I ended up speaking like it entrepreneur things like that like they were like hey we need you to come tell us how to do that or whatever it was, it was really weird um god can do whatever he wants right well anyway so i'm coaching at this school called houston christian high school and a man by the name of brandon gindon that i talked about earlier there's actually more to that story covid shut down my church where i was currently attending so I looked for a church where I could go. I walk in the door. The very first person I meet is a man by the name of Jim Putman, who was the one that planted the church in Post Falls. He doesn't even go there, but he was there because he spoke the night before. I shake Jim's hand. I don't know who this guy is. We talked for 25 minutes. He used to be a wrestling coach. Unbeknownst to me, after we spoke, he went and talked to Brandon. He said, there's a guy over there you need to meet. So I meet Brandon. Brandon and I become fast friends. The next thing I know is boys are playing for me at Houston Christian High School. And then the next thing I know, Brandon, as we are fast friends, looks at me and said, hey, whatever you're doing with the boys here at, on this team, I want you to do for the men in this church. And then, so, uh, so now, I, I'm uh, the men's pastor at our church. Weird, huh? Like, are, are y'all seeing all, like, this is, like, wheat harvest to this? And so God still does amazing, wonderful things. And then we, we developed a relationship over time with a Maritime Christian College. And so that 
ladies and gentlemen, is how we ended up here. And so the angel, you know, the angel talked to Philip. The angel that talked to me was Tom and Tim. And they said, hey, w- would, you, would you come? And I, I gave them my background. And uh, I said, what would you like for me to say? And they said, say that. So that's what you're going to get over the next three days is that, okay? Uh, and so I'm really excited about sharing all of that with you. Um, if all of our days are ordained, as God says, like all of this is by design. We, all of that that I talk, I bet you if I was to talk about your journeys getting here, it would be very similar. And we're all in the same room at the same time. So some, one, of, one of us is supposed to learn something. And it may be you. It's probably going to be me. So I'm really looking forward to going on that journey. Y'all ready? Y'all ready to get started? We haven't even gotten started yet. That was just my background. (laughs) So here's how I'm going to set this up. The AM, I'm going to uh, give you parables about the kingdom of God, okay? Uh, There's two of them that we're going to cover, and they're the two that Jesus explains, and and the idea is where he tells us what the kingdom is going to be like. The kingdom can be, can be care, compared to or whatever. So we're, uh, in the morning sessions, we are going to cover the kingdom, okay? In the s- next morning session, uh, I'm going to give it, so that, that's going to be like the field, the soil, right? The m- next morning session, I'm going to kind of uh, shine a little light on what the church is from Ephesians chapter 3. And hopefully, you know, there's not anything that I'm going to share with you that's new. It's all old. And I'm not going to give anybody a new way to look at things. In fact, I'm going to give everybody an old way of looking at old things. Right? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then in, in the second sessions, we're going to do something kind of practical. Uh, so I'm going to make you think a little bit. Make you, make you uh, look at and measure some things and, and practice some things. And then during the uh, night session, the sermon... We're going to be going through the, the Great Commission. So what that's going to look like is tonight is uh, all authority has been given to me. Um, tomorrow night is therefore go. And then the last night is going to be uh, I will be with you always till the end of the age. So that's kind of the format. That's kind of the setup. And I'm really looking forward to presenting it to you. So um, without further ado, let's, let's go ahead and get into talk one. I promise that I shortened this because that front end was so long. Okay. So here we go. So I told you I was a weed harvester. Uh, I ran a Massey Ferguson 860 combine. Uh, I, I got very proficient at it at a, at a very young age. And um, my grandfather taught me how to do it. It was a rite of passage. All the young men had to go do this. And we would start in Chillicothe, Texas. And as the wheat turned, as we headed north, we'd end up in South Dakota. And I think that was kind of the last leg of our tour. And then we'd drive all the way back, right? But I can, I can cut wheat anywhere. I can cut wheat in Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado. I can cut, I can cut, man, I, if I could get back in that combine, I could run it right now. I, I have not forgotten how to do it. And so uh, we were cutting in Dalhart, Texas. Is there anybody in here that's ever heard of Dalhart, Texas? There's no way. It is the jumping off place of the world. I'm telling you, Dalhart, Texas. Um, and, and, and they grow their wheat kind of interesting out there. They grow it in circles. Every place grows it different, but... Uh, very large, big circles, and, and they had a really good crop, and uh, I was cutting it. It didn't take very long for my bin to get full, and so I was going to offload, um, and so if, if you're familiar with harvesting, you, you, you pull your combine up next to the truck, you swing your auger, you uh, turn on your auger, and, and wheat starts pouring out into the truck, and you kind of have to go back and forth like this uh, as the man standing in the wheat kind of shovels it, and you make it all even. Well, I jerked it. And, and so wheat spilled out of the back. And I looked out there, and the farmer was there. Okay, somebody knows how the story's already going. <laughs> and the farmer was there, and I was like, oh, well. So I swung my auger back, went back out to the field. And so I, I'm going back to the field, and I start, you know, engaging the whatever. And I, I hear coming up the ladder well. And then on the window, I get this. I'm, and I stop it, and he, he, opens the, he opens the door, and he goes, you get down there, and you shovel that wheat back in the truck. Except he didn't say, you get down. He said, you get, you, you know. I was probably 15. I was like, yes, sir. So I got down and grabbed my shovel and 
sat there and shoveled. And I mean, there was still a few little seeds, a few little kernels. You know, by the time I'm sitting there dropping them in the shovel, he wanted every single one of them thrown in the back of that truck. And then I got back in the combine and drove, and I was kind of mad. And I was like, what's his deal? Right? And then I started thinking about it. You know what? That weed is his livelihood. He, he sowed that in tears. And the last thing he needs is a 15-year-old joker that coming in from out of town to cut it and not care about that hat full that spilled off the back. And what I learned about that is farmers don't waste seed, do they? They don't. And in fact, farmers become incredibly intentional with seed, and they minimize risk. And that's why we have verses in the Bible like Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and 4 that says, he who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap, right? Like, it, <laughs> we're not, we're not going to scatter flippantly. And needless to say, I became much more careful myself. And it got me thinking about the story, the first story that we're going to cover here today. Uh, because what, what, we, what I want to do throughout the course of this week is have it where we're all, as seeds, the gospel is rooted and established in all of our lives so that we may comprehend the love of Jesus Christ together, all right? So here we go. So today we're going to be looking at the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, and it has plenty to say about scattering seed, and the seed in this parable is explained to be the word of the kingdom, the gospel. So let me just ask this. How many of you are familiar with this parable? Probably everybody in this room. Parable of the sower, right? Familiar with it? Okay. And so how many of you have heard it preached that, you know, it's, it's all about the soil types and the condition of the heart and, and all those kind of things, right? Is that, is that, raise your hand if that's how you've heard it. Okay. Some of you. Um, and, you know, I believe that to be true. Uh, and if that's the direction you want me to take it today, you're going to be disappointed in me today. Okay? Because uh, I'm not going in a different direction. I'm not going in a new direction. Uh, I want to see if I can prove this. In your Bibles in Matthew 13, what's the name of the parable? The parable of what? Okay? In, in uh, Matthew 13, 18, where Jesus says, hear the parable of the sower. Is it called the parable of the soils? Okay, it's the parable of the sower. So today we're going to study this uh, passage from the perspective of the sower. Are you all okay with that? Okay. So here we go. So, so may, this may be new for some of you. It's not a new way to look at it. It's just from the perspective of the sower. And if, and if this is Jesus telling us what the kingdom is like, we can, we can glean a lot from it. All right. So... Um, if the seed is the gospel, the word of the kingdom, what kind of sower do you think you are? And if you're not currently sowing, what kind of sower do you think you would be? So maybe you're the careful kind that is always watching the wind, waiting for the perfect conditions and never sow anything at all. Uh, maybe you are a, a soil sampler who consistently judges soil types and will refuse to sow at any sign of rocks or thorns. Uh, maybe, maybe you keep your seeds stored in barns. Like, I, you just keep it to yourself. Maybe you have given up on sowing altogether and you sold the land and you've let, let them build a subdivision. I don't know. Yep. Or maybe you sow in tears at the possibility of reaping with songs of joy. So let's take a look at this parable and see what God has for us. So I'm going to start uh, with the parable in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And it says this. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by, beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow... And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. 
Other seeds fell on the good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. God bless the reading of his word, right? And so then there's a, a section in between uh, what I'm about to read here next where they're like, why do you keep telling them in, you know, parables? And, you know, and he explains why he does and how it fulfills prophecy and all those kinds of things. But then he explains this parable uh, a few verses later in verse 18 through 23. So here, here's the explanation of the parable I just read. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what is sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what is sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, and in one case, a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. Okay? Sure does sound like a lot about soil to me, <laughs> right? So, if, but if this is a parable about the sower, what can we learn about sowing when it comes to scattering the word of the kingdom? And as I said, this is one of the few that Jesus actually explains. Uh, the other one is the parable of the weeds, which we'll discuss Thursday. I, I've got a really nice application for that, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. But it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say who the sower is in this parable, does he? In that next parable, he does. In the, in the, in the one about the weeds, he says the sower is the son of man. In this one, he doesn't. Because in this one, the sower is anyone who scatters the seed of the kingdom. It is you and me. Remember that this parable tells us what the kingdom is like. So we are the sowers in the kingdom, and this tells us what we can expect. We are the, ones, the called out ones responsible for spreading the seed, which is the word of the kingdom. The kingdom has come, and Jesus is trying to tell us what it'll be like. He is telling us what to expect. Therefore, here's the application. So remember what that story I told you about the farmer in, in Dalhart. Farmers don't waste seeds. So why is Jesus telling a story about a guy that just goes around throwing seed everywhere? You wouldn't, the farmer in Dalhart wouldn't scatter seed on the road. He proved it to me, right? They're pretty careful about throwing it amongst thorns. They're really careful about, you know, man, there's rocks there. I'm not going to put my seed there. And yet we have this story where, where Jesus is kind of telling us um, to be careless with it. We, here's the application. We must spread the seed broadly. And so I need you to consider something for a second. Think about this. Who are you actually okay with going to hell? I mean, is there anybody that you're just, like, okay with it? Like, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, that, you know, that, that girl that uh, runs the cashier at the, the cashier at the supermarket, I don't really particularly care for her. I don't think our political ideologies line up. You okay for her to go to hell? You know, what about the, the craziness we see on TV? We okay with them? So here, here's the deal. I mean, if you're, <laughs> I, I, you're probably sitting there, well, I'm not okay with anyone going to hell. Well, that's the good answer. But sure, if you're honest, you probably could think of one or two people, right? Hmm. I'm reminded of a YouTube video of Penn Gillette. Uh, he, he's a magician with the, the Penn and Teller group. And maybe you've seen it. You can go online and see it right now. But anyway, he, he's a magician. And Penn Jillette makes a video to Christians about a man that waited after his show to give him a Bible. And Penn Jillette is a devout atheist. He's not about it at all. But the man uh, gave it to him and just said, hey, I thought that you might want to have this. I would like for you to read it. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and whatever. And 
And he said he was very respectful and he was very kind. And Jen uh, Penn Gillette was very respectful. But he said, thank you. Hey, I appreciate that. But then he goes and makes a video to us. And he said, hey, I just want you all to know that one of your guys did this. And I would like to know why all of you aren't doing it. Because if you don't believe, I mean, if you actually believe that I might suffer an eternity separated from God in hell, how much would you have to hate me not to tell me? Right? I found that absolutely fascinating. If you really believe this stuff, how much would you have to hate them not to tell them? We should scatter broadly. So I'm also reminded of the apostles' attitude when they literally went all over the world. Um, Paul didn't arrive in Ephesus or Corinth or Rome and was like, yeah, they don't want to hear it. <laughs> right? He didn't do that. Like, can you imagine? He, he did it anyway. There, there's no way. Um, I honestly believe that based on their attitude, their vigor, and the deaths that they died, they had Jesus' words echoing in their ears from Matthew 24, 14. Uh, where it says, and the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Uh, like there's this condition that Jesus, there's actually a condition that has to be met before Jesus returns, according to what he said. Like when everybody hears it, then the end will come. And I get the idea that these guys were like, okay, somebody tell me who that last joker is that needs to hear it so I can tell him so he'll come back. That's what the kingdom is like right? And w wouldn't it be amazing if we, as the church, believed that and imitated it? We must start spreading the gospel broadly, again, everywhere. You did, next thing that we must do is spread seed bountifully. Uh, based on this parable, it appears that we aren't supposed to be stingy with the seed. In fact, we should somewhat be careless with it, uh, when it comes to where we spread it. And if it falls on the path, so be it. And if it falls on the rocks, there's a chance at life. In the thorns, maybe it'll grow above it. But no matter what, spread it. Because according to Jesus, according to this parable, what he says the kingdom is going to be like is at least 75% of the time it's going to get rejected some kind of way or choked out. So you better just be throwing it out there. Right? If we want to save 30 in our lifetime, we better be telling 120. Is, is that making sense? Okay. So no matter what, spread it. Uh, we only have a 25% chance. And so I, I want to show you something. If, if we got a graphic, I think I have a graphic. Uh, it's got like a world. Oh, yeah. man, y'all are fantastic. Let's go. Okay. So I want to show you something. We've, we've got two different models of kind of how church works nowadays. Um, the one on the left is kind of the typical model where you've got the pastor and it's his job to save the world. It's his job to scatter the seed, right? And so like, so that's the pastor saving the world. He's like, yay. And all the people behind them are the congregants and they're cheering them on. They're like, go pastor, you go get them, right? And uh, so pastor, go get them. Um, and, and we're going to be the audience and we're going to put the money in the plate so you can go get them, but we're just going to show up and we're going to sit. And if you preach good enough, maybe I'll invite one of my friends that's somewhat interested. But discipling is not my responsibility, it's yours, so you got to do a good job. And so we're going to be over here cheering for you, supporting you. And if you've got 10,000 churches doing that, then you've only got 10,000 sowers which I know I've got ministers in the room, that sowing stuff's pretty hard. Especially when you're shepherding a church at the same time. And so if you're doing that, that's, that's a lot of work for that guy. And it's probably not going to get the return that the one on the right will get. So what if, so this is my first little nugget of this entire thing, maybe to get us thinking something different. What if we adopted the model on the right, which is actually biblical in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, you're familiar with it, where it talks about that the, the role of ministers is actually to equip the saints for ministry. Like, we're, we're not supposed to be these great orders. <laughs> what we are supposed to be is great coaches. That's it. Do, do you know how I ended up ministry from, from being a football coach? Because it's not a whole lot different than what I was doing. 
<laughs> honestly. And so our, our church has adopted the model on the right where it's the pastor going, all right, guys, y'all can do it. Y'all got this. Here's how you do it. And guess what? We train our folks. Richard's been there when they did it. When we trained them, we had 200 and something of our leaders, and we're training them how to disciple people. It is part of our DNA. Our church looks very different than, than a lot of others um, in that regard. Uh, and so through the course of this lectureship, I'm going to try to show y'all some of that stuff so that at least you can be thinking about like, okay, uh, maybe that is something that we can try. We don't have all the answers. I, I want y'all to know this right now. We're not that slick. I mean, we're not. Greg, we're not that slick. Like, uh, you know, uh, when, when we read in the book of Acts about 3,000 being added in a day, and we go, man, if only it could be like that again. Well, we kind of got some of that going, and I think that I know how they felt. They were probably like, what do we do with all these people, right? Like, what, what do we do now? Uh, I would love to tell you that we have this great strategy, and we're smart, and we're slick, and we got ideas. We don't. We just look at the Bible and look at the method and go, okay, well, let's try that, and it works. That's really honestly what we do. Uh, but our role in the ministry at our church is we try to train our people to be the ones that are scattering the seed. And guess what? If you have more people scattering seed broadly and bountifully, and what I'm about to say boldly, then, you know, we, we have, if we only have about a 25% return at best, guess what? You have more disciples. If you are making more disciples, you plant more churches. You don't plant churches to make disciples. Does that make sense? That's kind of the model. So anyway, I just wanted to show you that, that that's, that's, that's actually biblical. You can check my work on that. What if we did that? And, and I know uh, some of the ministers in the room, uh, you guys are thinking like, whoa, um, Man, I don't know. I've got. To, I, mean, I spend 30 hours on my sermon every week. I want to show you something at the end of the week where it'll cut that time at least by 60%. Okay? And we're all going to do it together. It's going to be cool. Y'all good with that? Okay. So lastly, uh, we spread the seed boldly. We have to be brave. If 25% are going to be receptive, we have to get to the point where we can stand rejection. Jesus warned us about this at the Sermon on the Mount didn't he? Uh, that we're going to be persecuted. We're going to be rejected. Like, guess what, Christians? Toughen up. Thicken your skin. Jesus tells you in the parable of the sower, if you're going to be a sower, you're going to get rejected. Some of it's going to fall on the path. Some of it's not going to work. And here's the beautiful thing. We're not on the, we're not on the hook for the outcome. There's our part. There's God's part. And then there's their, their part. And we can do everything that we can to help them with the outcome, but we're not on the hook for it. So uh, I just want to say this as far as spreading the seed boldly. Um, if we don't do that, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Jesus tells us in Luke 9, uh, verse 26, he says, For whoever is ashamed of me in my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes into the glory of the Father and the holy angels. That's in the Bible. So the only alternative is for us not to share it, and that doesn't really work too well for us, does it? You know, uh, I want the world to change as much as anyone. I do. And I used to think that, you know, being a former Marine, I was going to have to get my rifle and, you know, wear my plates and go start a revolution or something. I don't know. But that's, that's not going to work as well as this. You want to see the world flipped? You want to see the world change? We don't need to innovate, ladies and gentlemen. We need to imitate. That's what we need to do. And it could happen right here in Canada. And what, so what might actually happen if we did? Like, what might the results be? What if we actually tried it? I have found that all it takes for a revival to start is a few people, just one or two, two or three, not one, two or three people to start taking the gospel serious. When, you know, you, you've seen it at Asbury, you see, you know, these things pop up all over the world, and it's always unplanned, isn't it? It's like a couple people get together, and, you know, we're going to take this gospel thing serious. And then other people go, y'all are actually taking this serious? Me too. And then, like, all of a sudden, there's revival, and nobody wants to leave. It's weird. But when you plan revivals, we're going to have a revival in the parking lot, you get a production. <laughs> 
Yep. So imagine if that happened here in Canada. What, what, imagine if just because we got together this week, a few of us started taking the gospel seriously, and all of a sudden we're like, what, I got to go home, but y'all can, y'all can start that revival. No, I'm kidding. If, it's, if it warms up, I'll stay. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> uh, the gospel is the message. Discipleship is the method, and we're going to talk about that in the next session. Uh, but we cannot divorce the method from the message. I would say that probably 95% of the churches that preach on Sundays get the message part right. Like who Jesus is and what he did. I mean, the message we get right. It's the method where we fail. And and we'll talk more about that. So I have a letter from Jesus that he wrote to the church in Ephesus. And I think it's proper for us to explore it uh, now that I I close this first lecture. So um, it's, it's in Revelation. It says this, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested ones who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And I purposely didn't cite that because I just wanted you to hear the letter from Jesus. We must heed this same warning for Christ today. We must return to our first love. The men we read about in the Bible, the men and women we read about in the Bible... We're excited about their salvation. They were on fire and they shared it. However, this group got so used to filtering out the false teachers, they, they went on this like quest not to be wrong anymore, right? So that, you know, according to this letter, they, they got so bent on filtering out false teachers, they went into safe mode and then just tried not to be wrong. Does that sound familiar to anyone? That sounds familiar to my entire growing up. Just, not, just don't be wrong. <laughs> but like that became the goal. Just don't be wrong. So, uh, does that, yeah, so I'm ahead of my notes. Does that sound familiar? That sounds like the Church of North America to me. So, as we close this session, this is what I would like for us to do. Just take a minute to be with the Lord and be honest with Him about the following. You know what, uh, what I want to do? It's, it's time. Uh, remember how excited you were when you came to salvation and tried to make yourself feel it again. Can you do that? Can you dial that up? Like, pray that the Holy Spirit has you do that. Remember, like, I remember when I got saved. I, I remember it. I remember it. I remember how I felt. And I remember being excited. I remember I wanted to tell everybody. So allow yourself to feel that again. I would ask that after you heard this parable of the sower, that you think about what broken beliefs you may be living out for which you need to repent. Where have you, like, held the seed when you should have been scattering it? Where have you been okay with somebody potentially going to hell? Right? And lastly, if you feel like your lampstand has been removed, make a commitment to repent and ask Jesus to give it back. Because, ladies and gentlemen, you are a city on a hill. You are salt and light. You are Jesus' plan A. There is no plan B. We're going to talk about that in the next session. Like, you are the outcalled ones. You are the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. They're, they don't know about the kingdom if we don't tell them. And it's only the most important thing ever. We must spread this seed of the kingdom broadly, bountifully, and boldly. And as I said, there is just one condition that Jesus said must be met before he returns. And it's that the gospel must go to all nations, to everyone. So once again, let's find out who that last person is and let's go tell them. Because I don't know about you, I'm ready to see him. Lord, come quickly.